Hello, everyone. Welcome into the latest edition of the Wolverine podcast. Anthony Broom here with Chris Ballas and Clayton Safey here a little later than we normally are. Monday scheduled uh, with football press conferences. We had a basketball game at six. Just couldn't quite make it work to do a pod. So we figured we'd wait until the morning when we had a basketball game to talk about and uh, maybe a full night's sleep uh, to talk about some of the stuff we heard uh, with Sharon Moore in the football program coming off of their bye week. Uh, fellas? It was the bye week. I know we all promised different sorts of activities over the weekend. Did uh, did we cross all of our our things we wanted to do off the list? Did uh, for the most part. So, and uh, you know what? It's nice. I like these bye weeks. Now I like the two bye weeks, and it gives you time to kind of catch your breath and and then get prepared for Thanksgiving and the holidays and everything else. And uh, hopefully they get healthy. At, at the the football team got healthy and they come out strong. They need a they need a good last couple of weeks here, guys, to restore a little bit of faith here. Yep. I watch a lot of football. I, mm-hmm. I like I like football. I like guys that like football. They like me back. So it's uh it's a lot of fun. That's why you're here. That's right. Well, we'll talk basketball now, then I guess. Um no, I'm just kidding. I, I love uh, basketball are, too. You know me. <laughs> uh we are brought to you today as we are every week uh, on Monday night by our friends over at Home Field Apparel. You've heard us talk about them uh for several years at this point. Uh think very highly of our friends down in Indianapolis and all of the things that they uh, do to create really sweet vintage looking apparel uh, for the Michigan Wolverines. Uh, I've got the platinum box that I got earlier this football season. It's got the hoodie. It's got a long sleeve t-shirt. It's got, uh, you know, the, the trucker hat. It's got all these things in there uh, that Michigan fans, uh, you're going to want to outfit yourselves with uh, this holiday season, the bomber jacket Clayton has been rocking one of those. They've got a new dad hat that's out. Um, you know, all these uh, again, the sweatshirts as comfortable as can be, joggers, uh, amazing t shirts, softest shirts I own. Uh, so get, get your shopping for Michigan fans done on homefieldapparel.com. Uh, this holiday season, use that promo code Wolverine for 15% off your first order. Um, and there's a lot to choose from there. And if it's not Michigan, there's a through Z, they've got just about every single school you can possibly think of, including, uh, unfortunately, the rival schools in your life if you have those people to shop for as well. So use that promo code Wolverine for 15% off your first order over at homefieldapparel.com. And once again, thank you to our friends there or for their continued sponsorship of our website. Uh, we're also brought to you today by ourselves. Uh, use that promo code UM1 for two months of access for our video and YouTube viewers. Uh, for only $1. Now, right now, that's going to get you. Let's just do the math here. It's mid-November, uh, getting into late November. Season's almost done. You got signing day coming up. We assume Michigan football will have some changes to the coaching staff. Obviously, transfer portal guys coming in, transfer portal guys coming out. So that $1 uh, right now, if you use it over the next two months, uh, is going to be the most bang for your buck that you could get on that deal, and uh, which is impressive because throughout the year, we do run that deal for the folks that watch uh, here on the YouTube channel. So take advantage of that today. That's promo code UM1. Uh, fellas, we are coming off of the second bye week of the year, as we said to start the show. Uh, what Sharon Moore and Michigan football is affectionately dubbing buy-in week. And I know what the takes right off the bat are. People will say, well, why wasn't day one of fall camp buy-in week? Why wasn't day one of spring ball buy-in week? Um Regardless, I think what it was for them is whatever you have to do, uh, whether it's getting healthy, whether it's you know cleaning up some of your mistakes, whether it's young guys trying to get on the field. I think the message there, sitting at five and five, you need one win to get the bowl eligibility. Would love to get two because we know what that game is at the end of the year. Um, I think the message was pretty clear in that hey, whatever your whatever you need to do this week to get yourself right, it's time to go in, go all in on it because they have a chance to finish this season out on. Uh, relatively speaking, a high note. A really high note if you beat Ohio State, right? Which uh, I, I doubt is going to happen, but you never know. And stranger things have happened. Not much stranger, but some stranger things have happened. And, uh, you know, first you got to beat Northwestern. Northwestern plays hard. They're not a very good football team, but they play, they bring it. And if you don't match your intensity, then you can be in a football game with them. That's the reason probably the point spread is only 11 and a half points, uh, which Clay loves for some reason. I still haven't gotten an explanation from you. I want to know why you love that point spread. Is that good or bad? Or, or it's good to be that... favored by double digits, baby. Okay, well, there you have it. So, um, but to me, it's, it's about – 
making progress, program progress now, right? And and guys playing to their potential, uh, offensive linemen playing together. I know it's late in the year, but man, if you could put it together for one game and get these guys on the same page, five is one, as Sharon Moore said yesterday at his press conference, and maybe do something special. I mean, a crappy Nebraska team went to, to – uh, to Columbus and nearly pulled off a win with all due respect to our producer there. Um, and probably with a better whistle would have won that game. So it only takes one, right? One out of, say you're going to win one out of a hundred, it, it, you know, make that the one. That's exactly what Herb Brooks said to the 1980 Michigan Olympic hockey team. I know I'm getting ahead of myself here, but that's the one I'm looking for guys. I am looking for forward to that Ohio state game. And, uh, but you better take care of business because God knows the Mayo bowl or the, mustard bowl or whatever it is awaits if you as your reward if you do yeah buy-in week is like the equivalent of me on a, a saturday morning reloading my account on one of the betting apps and saying okay <laughs> like it's not that i was i was checked out it's just that i had lost some of my money a little bit made some mistakes along the way and hey let's buy back in let's let's get the account up so we can throw some parlays out there um so that's kind of where they're at they're not checked out um and yeah, Anthony, I agree with you. Like the messaging, anything you say at this point, right? They could, if it, if they were ten and zero right now, and they had buy in week, everyone would love it. But and it'd be the same exact message as this. But they're five and five, so of course we'll all poke holes through it. But I like it. It was actually started by Max Bredesen, uh, came up with the term, and Sharon Moore liked it, and they rolled with it. And it doesn't mean they did all that much different, but it's clear that this team has stayed together through the ups and downs, which is huge because if you are going to finish here and, and reach bowl eligibility this weekend and go out the right way for the seniors uh, in their last game at the big house, if you are going to pull off a, a very, very improbable win at Ohio State, you have to have belief. You have to have a team that's connected. Um, you know, Certainly there are a lot of issues with this team, but it, it starts with that if you're going to have any sort of shot at doing those things. So I like it. Um, reload those accounts, and uh, let's get ready for a couple more weeks of uh, football slash you betting. Also, you also need Will Johnson. What was the vibe, A.B., Clay? Did you think that uh, the way that Sharon was talking that Will's going to play on Saturday? Not really. No. He, he said we'll I, see I, I how tend it to goes. think now. Yeah. Yeah, which yeah. is disappointing. I, yeah, and, and the thing at this point um, – it's kind of becoming like the elephant in the room. Like if you're not playing this week, are you really going to give it a go next week? And and if you don't give it a go next week, then um, I don't want to say there's, there's validity to people saying that he's shut it down, so to speak, but he's just not going to play in a bowl game. Like that won't happen. So um would love to see him back for Ohio state. I am skeptical about that. Given that um, even in last year's Ohio state game, when they said he could finish, he didn't. Um, and that's nothing against him, but uh yeah, obviously, any sort of upset effort that they could stage next week, it would be incumbent upon him being on the field. And I just, I don't even know if he's going to be that in a pitch count at this point. So we'll see what happens there. Um, well, no one, something no one I th thought Blake Corum. No one thought Blake was going to try to get it, give it a go. He didn't, wasn't effective. But guys try to, you know, they they do everything they can in this game. So I wouldn't be shocked. Like let's say he does need one more week. Who knows? Um, it's you know, it it, it could definitely could happen. We thought. Blake was going to go. We just didn't think he was going to last very long, and he didn't. No, I so, mean, we knew at a certain point, but, you know, coming right. off the Illinois game, a, a right. lot of people thought he wasn't going to play, and really yeah. he didn't make an impact. But the fact that he even tried was insane. Yeah. This isn't as serious of an injury, and, you know, it's one you could probably play on that. Sharon Moore said last week he started uh, – Will Johnson started running um, more. So, you know, he's clearly progressing, maybe not where they wanted him to be, but – uh, maybe another week could do it. I don't know. We'll see. Well, you, you got to think of this too. I mean, it for a lot of these guys, uh, it's not just Will Johnson. It's Mason Graham, Kenneth Grant, Colston Loveland. If there's validity to the fact that they go to a bowl game and those guys aren't playing, like this is your last chance to put something on film with a ton of NFL scouts watching because we know that the you know most of them across the league will probably be there for this game. So if they can get him right and he can go, I mean that's. I think that's been the objective all along. That's why you don't play him against, um, you know, the Michigan or uh, I don't know, Michigan State, Indiana. You're you're doing it to have him right for that last game. So, um, hey, I, I'm gonna hold out hope that he plays, just like everyone else. Uh, I, well, it seems like a few people are actually holding out hope at this point. But 
Um, I'll go down with that ship. So I, I do think we'll see Will Johnson play in that Ohio State game. Um, you know, in terms of game stuff, I mean, there's not a whole lot to kind of sink your teeth into with this Northwestern matchup. Like we know, we know they'll play physical. Uh, we know that they are a team that, um, you know, over the years has shown an ability to play up in games like this. Uh, but overall, I think what I took out of Sharon's press conference Monday, uh, given the positioning of the bye week, is it was so you know sort of the the wider ranging topics like NIL, like recruiting, like uh, the bowl game and player development. Um, those were especially from the NIL standpoint. I mean, the transformational over transactional conversation came up again. Obviously, we know what's going on on the recruiting trail right now with uh, the pursuit of Bryce Underwood, which isn't dead, by the way. A lot of people were quick to to uh, put the dirt on us and put the dirt on the situation when that happened last week. It is still very much alive, but um, that's a big storyline right now. The fact that you know whether or not people are happy with the number getting out there is what it is, but the fact of the matter is that Michigan – has shown that it is going to step up and be a part of these types of recruitments moving forward. And uh, Sharon was asked about it on Monday and said, Hey, listen, um, more, more or less said that this is where the game is going. Now we have to adapt. We have to be part of it. Um, and that's how it's going to be. And, you know, not all support he said from the donors is financial either. They help with the networking. They help with getting people in touch with other people. Um, you know, the post football stuff, it seems like that he's pretty happy with the support they have from donors right now. And how could you not be when you have the ear of a guy, you know, still a few days out from signing day? Yeah. And it's finally right. They it, losing is unfortunately a great motivator and we kind of predicted it, right. It's going to some people said, well, it's going to take a few years of, of losing, you know, five and seven or six and six. And then maybe the boosters will come around. Well, it took what one year of five and five and, the number one quarterback in the country in your backyard for guys to open their their eyes and open their wallets. And they weren't getting the support they needed from the administration. I don't think that's any secret now. I think it's pretty obvious, right, that they were not prepared when it came to NIL. We've been saying it forever. And it's amazing how I, I quoted Ward Manuel from Anthony's article from June of January 2024 after, after Sharon was hired. And he said, we aren't going to buy players, right? And we're transformational, not transactional. And then all of a sudden, here we are. So uh, there are jobs on the line. There are things that need to happen if you if people are going to protect their jobs. And and here we are. So, but uh, the one thing that concerns me is it, it certainly seems like Bryce Underwood's heart is with LSU, uh, and you know this is kind of a money play and that he really wants to be there at the same time people say well you know how is he going to do at michigan if he doesn't really want to be there and i go back to a bunch of guys who lamar woodley comes to mind uh was all michigan state all the time didn't like michigan and then at the end he just said you know what this is a better situation for me and became all blue the second that he got here and, he, and he's all michigan and has been all michigan ever since so guys get here and they you know they're, they're gonna they're gonna play hard no matter where they are and and then their hearts get into it um, for the most part so to me i i'm glad that they are are making a push i'm not sure how it's going to work and what i wrote is that you've had programs that are doing this for that have been doing this forever you still need the chemistry and you still need still need the culture and you still need great coaching and you can't it's otherwise you know you're texas a&m you're one of buying a bunch of players compared to maybe an alabama or georgia who's been doing it forever if we're being honest so there are a lot of pieces still to put together but I'm glad that they are making an effort because you need good players to win and you need great quarterback play to win in this day and age, guys. Those schools have been completely aligned because they they have been doing NIL decades before NIL. Um, yep. So they had the infrastructure and they just said, all right, let's just do this legally now. Uh, it's become even more legal. I think the difference between what Ward Manuel said in January and now is the Tennessee court injunction that mm -hmm. allows this um, in March. So uh, it, it's amazing what's even changed since the summer. I think Michigan's gotten a lot more aggressive. I think as Sean McGee, their general manager, has gotten settled in here, um, they've certainly made a bigger push. And I think that even it's not just donors maybe being motivated by some of the losing. It's probably the coaching staff and the support staff like Sean McGee that understand that, okay, December in the transfer portal is going to be a big uh, month for us. 
finishing this recruiting class strong, potentially with the number one player in the country, Bryce Underwood, would be massive, but not just him, others, certainly that they've landed. This is a very, very good class so far, and they could add to it and end up in the top five or something like that here before signing day. I would I would guess they end up getting Bryce Underwood, which would be huge. Um, but, you know, I think there's still time and, and things to play out here, but uh, it, that'll be interesting to watch. Um, you know, Sharon Moore said at his opening press conference back in late January that they wanted to be aggressive with NIL. They want to be aggressive with recruiting. He wanted to be kind of an out front head coach recruiter a little bit less. Uh, Jim Harbaugh was a little bit less of that later in his career. I think he trusted guys like Sharon Moore in the rest of his staff to get it done on the recruiting trail. And then certainly they had some issues with with NIL and didn't adapt quick enough. Uh, but it's kind of, you know, he, he's taken some of these recruitments upon himself, which, which I think is important. Um, and we'll see where it takes him. But I think you, I mean, you got to go all in on winning these next two games. But in the background, you, know, you got 24 hours in a day, right? I don't know how much these guys sleep at this point, but all the other hours you're kind of using on preparing uh, what you can for what next season is going to be. And a lot of that isn't next September when the, when the season kicks off. It's how do you set yourself up in the next several weeks for that? So it's it's just a huge time of year. You may be hiring new coaches at different spots as well while you're doing it simultaneously maybe he has to talk to dusty may and say hey how'd you do all that uh back in you know march and april last year when you were building a roster and a coaching staff uh it felt like dusty may had you know all 24 hours of the day at his disposal so it's uh it's going to be interesting to see how kind of how it plays out but it's pretty clear that he has a different take on it than uh maybe than jim harbaugh did he's getting more support though as well so i guess that that could have been the big change and we'll see where it takes him yeah, I think that's kind of putting a bow on all of it. I think that's why I like where this second bye week sits because it, it's clear to me, I think that they are getting a head start on some of those administrative things, some of those, you know, having a plan in place for what happens as soon as the regular season is over because you're not going to be preparing for a football game the week after Ohio State. Um, you know, you're going to be waiting, you know, what, whatever it is, a week to 10 days for your bowl assignment, um, should you get bowl eligible? And things are going to move pretty fast in terms of uh, portal guys, uh, guys jumping in from your program, guys jumping in from other programs. You're going to have some decisions to make on the coaching staff. So I, I think where this bye week sits was a good place to start getting those ducks in a row. Um, you know, we know that both Theron Moore and Kirk Campbell were watching Brady Hart on Friday night. Our EJ Holland was there. Uh, saw both of those guys there. So, They've got an eye on the 2026 class as well. So I, I think that, listen, I mean, this season is what it is at this point. The only thing that matters now is what comes next. And certainly you have these two challenges on, on the field these next few weeks. But um, I think that the, you know, the, the five or six week stretch after that Ohio state game might be, you know, the defining stretch for what Sharon Moore, um, you know, what tr the next iteration of Michigan football looks like under Sharon Moore. So, you know, as, as discouraging as some of the things have been, I'm excited. I'm intrigued as hell to see what he does with the benefit of a full off season with the benefit of, you know, the full portal cycle full hiring cycle, getting all those ducks in a row. And, um, you know, the, the self-evaluation part, you know, seeing the things that not that we're as smart as football coaches are though. I, I think some media probably thinks they are, but like addressing the things that is, that have been as clear as day, in terms of issues, in terms of things that have plagued them. So at least from a recruiting perspective, from an NIL perspective, really from an administrative perspective, I've been pretty impressed with how that's all come together. Uh, now it's it's time for them in the you know over the next month or so to figure out how that parlays into success on the field. But uh, any other final thoughts on football? No, just win, baby. Let's get this one on Saturday. It could be 42 and cloudy or partly cloudy, I think, and good football weather. And let's go to Columbus and, and make it interesting, fellas, and, and see what happens. I like that trip. Uh, last time was unbelievable. And, again, you just never know. So finish strong and hopefully, uh, you know, decent bowl game. It won't be a great bowl game, but uh, but just yeah, just finish strong and, and, and play with some pride. That's what I want to see. No doubt. All right. And the two bowl games, uh, I'm working on a bowl projections for later today. It seems like our most in play would be 
Pinstripe Bowl in New York and the Music City Bowl in Nashville. So uh, outside shot at the Detroit Bowl, I guess. W uh, we forget what that's called. It's had like 12 different game, games since I've been alive. Uh, game Above Sports, I believe. Okay. So all yep. three of those kind of in play. Uh, we'll see. Uh, that's That kind of seems like the slot you'd be in at six and six. If you find a way to get to seven and five, maybe the road opens to the Duke's Mayo Bowl. Get to see Sharon Moore uh, take the Mayo bath. Uh, would love to see the Pop Tarts Bowl. Uh, that is the most metal bowl that there is because you could devour the the mascot after the game. Uh, but hey, where is it? That? Is what it is. It's what. What's that? Where is that bowl? I think that's. Did that replace whatever like the Buffalo Wild Wings Bowl was? I think it's Tampa. I thought it was Charlotte. Or, or, or no, no, that's the Mayo Bowl. Yeah, maybe it's. Um, I don't know. Yeah, who cares. Yeah. whatever no, yep <laughs> it's not the college football playoff that's where we wanted to be that's right uh, let's switch gears to basketball but before we do that uh, i want to talk about another sponsor uh that we would like to shout out on this week's show uh today's show is brought to you by our friends over at five star fans the thrill the heartbreak the pride being a fan is a wild ride uh, with five star fans you can finally get in the game like never before Five Star Fans is the place where fiercely loyal fans can directly reward their favorite players. And for a limited time, Five Star Fans is giving you $5 to send to your favorite player. Visit, visit 5-starfans.com today. We just talked about things looking up for Michigan's NIL and some of the efforts there. Uh, Five Star Fans uh, is going to help Michigan's NIL if you get in on it. So get your $5 today uh, sent to send over at 5-starfans.com. That's 5-starfans.com. Switching over to basketball now. Uh, since last we spoke, Michigan has played a pair of games, a pair of wins. Um, impressive in different ways. Discouraging in some ways uh, when it comes to the turnovers. But 76-64 uh, win against TCU last Friday night uh, in the Frankie Collins Bowl. Uh, you win that game. And then Monday night, uh, Pretty interesting game. Uh, Michigan is flat early. Dusty May subs out his his entire starting lineup two minutes and 53 seconds into the game. Uh, 12 first half turnovers, but uh, they figure it out. Things click back into place, and they beat Miami of Ohio 94-67 uh, at Chrysler Center. A little bit of a lighter crowd, 6 o'clock on a Monday, just a weird tip coming off a weekend. But um, next up, Tarleton State Thursday night at Chrysler Center, 8.30, so a later tip. And then next week, they will head to Fort Myers uh, for the Fort Myers tip-off. I will be there in attendance for that. Excited to get down there. Wow. Where they will play Virginia Tech and either uh, Xavier or South Carolina on Wednesday. So that's what's happened since last we talked. That's what's ahead for Michigan uh, after uh, this stretch or after this game on Thursday. Uh, let's talk about these last two games. And, and I don't know if... We go game by game, but just in general, um, that'd be great to see. First and foremost, I think you 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 look at that Wake Forest game, you look at the TCU game on the schedule, and you're you're hoping to just split one of those games. You would have loved to have both of them. Probably should have had both of them mm -hmm. uh, if the floor was a little drier uh, there in Greensboro, North Carolina. But uh, you bounce back, get a nice double digit win over TCU, come back on Monday night and blast Miami of Ohio. Uh, just overarching thoughts from the first or these last two games that we've seen. A maddening turnovers, number one. It's fine to have a few more turnovers when you play at the pace they do. It, it, they aren't going to be a 10, 11 turnover a game team because of the, the pace they play. But it's the careless ones that lead to breakouts at the other end, the pick sixes that you call that, that keep teams in games and give games away that piss you off and piss Dusty May off. And he's like, enough of this crap. We're going to go and we're going to play some guys here who are going to protect the ball. So they did that in the second halves of both games and they pulled out two games. I love the offense more. So I love the defense and the intensity they play with on that end of the floor. The great John Beeline said, even after the game on the big 10 network, he said, it was really was their defense that made the difference. They were it, Miami was take, making some unbelievable shots, fellas, in this game, and uh, it was kind of reminded you of Oakland. And uh, at some point, that's just bad luck. But 
for the most part, the defense was fantastic. The switches were fantastic. And what they've got to do now is start cutting down on the turnovers. As John Beeline also said, he said, you don't make 50-50 plays. You can take 50-50 shots, but you don't take make the 50-50 passes that Danny Wolf, for example, is making way too many of him. Of He's got to get it together there and stop turning the ball over. But I love the guard play. I love Trey Donaldson. Uh, Trey Donaldson's a stud, great kid. If he and as Beeline also said, if he's a leader, then watch out. This team's going to be really, really good. He said they are extremely talented. LJ Kaysen had a nice back uh, bounce back game. So there's a lot to like. And as they figure out their rotations and what works best, and maybe shorten the bench a little bit or use the combinations that they that they know are better, this is going to be a good basketball team, in my opinion. And that's exciting in year one. It's funny, Beeline said that about not making the 50-50 plays. They're like, take 50-50 shots, mm-hmm. don't make the 50-50 plays. He said, every player that's ever played for me knows this. And 10 minutes before that, Ant Wright on Twitter had tweeted that. He said, mm-hmm. don't make 50-50 passes like this. Mm-hmm. Um, so certainly he was getting through to those guys. And and they played a different style when it was John Beeline at the helm. Uh, one of the things that they tried to do to you know maximize their possessions was to not turn the basketball over this style you're probably going to have 13 or 14 turnovers a game if you're good at protecting the ball because you you have more possessions so just the math goes up there and you know there's you got to take some of the good with the the bad if you're going to put what's that and the speed too the speed with what you're playing right exactly you got to take some of the good with the bad in that hey you're going to make some of these plays off a transition um, you know, but also it's going to cost you at times as well. And you're playing with two seven footers. So those two things, uh, you know, are, are factors that are going to lead to more turnovers, but it's the ones up top, uh, when you're trying to initiate the offense and you just don't, uh, you know, have a guy in position well enough. He doesn't use his body to get open enough. Doesn't, you know, aggressively, uh, fight for a catch or a guy just throws a lazy pass when it's not there. Um, you know, they're asking guys to drive into the middle of the floor and then collapse the defense and pass to a guy who's cutting. And a lot of these guys haven't played in this style before. So I think you're going to have some of these growing pains. Um, they've got to get them corrected, uh, certainly early on. But uh, then when it clicks and they do take care of the ball, I mean, it's it's kind of a ridiculously productive offense. Um, they rank fifth in the country right now an effective field goal percentage at 64.4%. So when they're not turning the ball over, they're getting really good shots. They're knocking them down. They're shooting 41.3% from three. They're shooting 66.4% from inside the arc. Um, And a lot of guys kind of standing out. It's not necessarily always the same guys every night, but uh, they have enough, as Dusty said before the year, uh, enough capable players that even if some guy has a down game or he gets in foul trouble, other guys will step up and, and you can't say enough about Donaldson and what he's done, but also Namari Burnett, these last two games, 16 points, 18 points. Um, the way he moves without the ball, the way he runs in transition. Uh, you know, I think what most of his assists, uh, which he had four last night and most of his points came in transition. Um, he's playing a completely different role than he did last year. And he's excelling at it where, he can drop 20 any night, but you don't necessarily need him to or rely upon that. Uh, it's just a great thing to have. So, uh, you know, you, you like the way they're pushing the ball. 40 transition points last night, which is insane. Um, and, you know, they got to get the half-court offense a little bit better. Uh, they're defending really well. But beyond that, I, I think that the turnovers are, are just the number one thing they have to uh, – they have to limit. They have to eliminate some of the, the turnovers. Some of them are the cost of doing business, but some of them are – are not and and that's why you you bench all five of your starters and you know less than three minutes into the game and and you know you continue to to harp on that message you know as you go forward yeah you look at the uh the turnover numbers on Ken Palm, you know 24.6 uh, which is 346 out of how many division one teams are there like 364 it's 364 i mean it's that's bad and when you look at this that's what's funny about this matchup on on Thursday night. Tarleton State is dead last in yes. turnover percentage in in basket in college basketball. So um, could be a little bit sloppy. The ingredients are there for that to be uh, the case, but you simply you just can't turn the ball over one out of every four times down the floor. And when you're in these modes where it's happening in clusters like that, 
you know, good teams are gonna are gonna bury you early. And you know, the defense to me, I think has been incredibly encouraging. I think better than I thought it would be. I think even despite like knowing how this roster came together, I think they're a little more athletic, uh, a little more versatile on the defensive end than I thought they might be. Um, and Clayton, I think you're right. I mean, in, it's inherent with the style that they play that they are going to turn the ball over when you want to play as fast as they do. And, you know, those are tweaks that they still need to figure out too. Like maybe they're playing a little too fast. Maybe these guys just need to keep drinking out of the fire hose, play through these mistakes, or though obviously like he's not going to let them keep playing through the same mistakes when we see, um, you know, what happened with the lineup change early in the game, but the message got through and the rest of the way, I think the second half, they only had what the six turnovers. So uh, it, it was good to see. I, I think, you know, the highs of this team to me so far outweighed, you know, when you see, and, and this is just, I'm not picking on anyone on social media or on our message board, but you see the box score, you see the turnovers, the, you know, the maddening um, extent to which it's happened. And people say, oh, gosh, they're sloppy. That This team stinks. They're not any good. Everyone overrated them. I, I think that the highs of this team are good enough to, you know, enable them to play through this, to figure some of this stuff out. And, you know, again, I know we all put Michigan basketball on this John Beeline era pedestal, and rightfully so. I mean, that's – if they can get back to that, I mean, that's – that'd be incredible. But – I just don't think the style of play is going to lend itself to having those games where you only have five or six turnovers. Like those are outliers um, of a different kind of era. So to me, I think that you let the guys play through it. It's clear that they're still kind of finding what their best lineups, what their best looks are. And the blessing of being as deep as they are is that if your starters come out and they don't have that spark, they don't have that fire. You yank them right out. You put your bench in there, and those guys have to watch the other guys play, and that lights the spark. So if they don't have it, you light it underneath them. And uh, I just think uh, top to bottom, I think overall, I think it the, the positives have outweighed the few negatives that there's been. It's interesting to me now that uh, Justin Pippen is back, that the lineup has kind of gone to 11. I wonder if that's going to get pared down a bit, at least you know among the freshman guards and what that pecking order winds up looking like. But you know, again, sitting at three and one, I, I don't, I mean, it's not unexpected. I think you'd prefer to be four and oh, but, um, you know, going into, uh, you know, the, the stretch run here of the month of November and then, uh, December is pretty tough. A couple conference games, you've got the, you know, the Arkansas game, the Oklahoma game. Um, there's some big tests coming up here and, and this next week to 10 days, I think is going to be pretty big for this group. Yeah, and this is when we find out. And we can talk about E-field goal percentage and defensive intensity. The one thing I don't think will change is the defensive intensity, and they bring it every game. doesn't matter who they play. That's going to always give you a good chance to win. And then if you can continue to score at a high level, a higher level anyway, it's not going to be what it is against the better teams. But if you can do that and you can – protect the ball just a little bit better then you've got a chance to be a really good basketball team. So it's, it's been fun to watch and I know it'll get better under dusty may. He doesn't, didn't seem at all concerned even after the disappointing loss to wake forest. And you're going to see this team continue to get better. So it's nice to have this guys and looking at these, looking at the schedule, it's so interesting, man, seeing USC and UCLA on that schedule in Washington. It's so weird, but I like it, fellas. I'm, I'm excited about it. And it's going to be, it's back. Good to be back at Chrysler center again with a chance to win every, every game. Yeah. And maybe it's just playing Miami, Ohio, which I think is a actually a pretty capable team with the way they shoot mm -hmm. the ball. I mean, four really good shooters on the floor. We'll see what they do in the Mac. It'll be kind of interesting to watch. And then, if they do make the postseason, you got a lot of shooters and you shoot the the three at over 40%. Um, you, you got a chance, really, in any game. Who knows? You can make it weird. And they were up 30 to 27 on Michigan. But I saw progress in other areas, too, last night. Um, just scrapping for rebounds. Vlad Golden was a little bit more active he was. in the second half. Sam Walters uh, does a lot of the little things. And I asked Dusty May about that after the game, and he said that's something they've really challenged him to do, that – okay, you're not going to get all that many open threes anymore. People have seen what you can do. He, he did knock down his open three in the right corner, which he loves. And then he, he had a two, um, you know, the smaller guy on him. He kind of just scooped it up over him. But Dusty May said, you're impacting the game in other ways. One, you're making, you're allowing us to play four on four because somebody is just right next to you 
at all times. And two, you have to be able to get some rebounds. He had four last night. He had two assists. I was encouraged by that. Justin Pippen, the last couple of games, he's still on a minutes restriction, but um, he's impacted the game. He drew two charges last night. He had a chase down block on a three pointer. Um, Darrell Brooks is kind of the defensive specialist. You're kind of seeing, you know, at the end of halves, you're kind of seeing some other things come together. Of course it was Miami, Ohio, but um, you know, a little bit of progress there. TCU game. I thought the second half was really good in some of those areas as well. So as he said, right, you want to win on the margins well, you figure some of the other things out. You know, maybe they didn't do that in the first couple games, uh, even the Cleveland State game. You know, there were some things with rebounding and everything else that they wanted to to improve. But you're starting to see a little bit of, of improvement there. He's, as he said last night, incremental progress um, in a lot of different areas. Of course, got to eliminate the turnovers, but you're kind of seeing it it come together a little bit more. I'm I'm interested to see what the rotation looks like come mid-December maybe I mean when when is it going to get pared down I mean you do play a faster pace and he said he even said like it's it's tough to decide who to put in the game because you are playing faster you need to play more guys you understand that guys do want to you know be out there getting a rhythm um so it, it's not easy decisions upcoming here for for the staff but um I think they'll kind of just to take it in stride and, and kind of make that incremental progress. And by January and February, you know, hopefully we're not talking as much about the turnovers, but you know, some different areas that they're improving in. So yeah, uh, Tarleton state Thursday at eight 30 PM at Chrysler center. Um, and then the Fort Myers event uh, with Virginia tech on Monday at six. Uh, if they win, they would play at eight 30 on Wednesday. If they lose, they would play at six on Wednesday. Uh, and then they're off until Tuesday, uh, December 3rd, when they head to Wisconsin for the Big Ten opener. So uh, got a bye game coming up on, on Thursday and then uh, some, some interesting challenges up ahead. Uh, let's close things out by going into our Q&A session. Uh, and as I am one to do, I closed out of the link. So give me just a second to bring it back up. Um, and we will take one from jay schult this is back to football now he says is there any chance we get to see jordan marshall get some carries over the next two weeks or are there any freshmen uh that will get more playing time for that matter i think you'll see ben hall probably get more carries than than jordan marshall i, I would love to see jordan marshall get some carries i think he's dynamic you see it in the kick returns right this guy's got something to bring to the to the table so mason curtis i bet will get some more play they've been speaking highly of him so those are a couple of guys that in my opinion you'll see more of but i'd love to see marshall me too i i'd like to see a couple carries from him he hasn't played on offense yet this year but like you said, I mean, there's just so much more juice when he's returning kicks than than Keyshawn Harris, um, who I didn't think did a very good job of it all, all season. And, and Jordan Marshall was hurt, so that's why he was back there. But they they handled it really well, I thought. They waited till last week to play him, even though it seemed like he was available, looked good in warm-ups the week before. Um, or, you know, two weeks ago now with the bye is when he played. But um, now he, he has his redshirt year no matter what. Bowl game doesn't count against that if they make one. And I think he can impact on special teams, maybe get some carries as well in the bowl game, depending on who plays, who doesn't. Uh, Mason Curtis, they, you know, Sharon Moore called him a future star and a tackling machine yesterday. So uh, I think we see that. If Will Johnson doesn't play especially, I think more run for Mason Curtis and uh, Brandon Hillman, who's a sophomore, because uh, you move Makari Page, you know, still down to the slot. So I think that opens up some opportunities for those guys. So I agree with with um, Mason Curtis. I think getting some more run. He looks pretty good out there. Six foot five safety. You don't see him. Much. He looks like pretty it. good. Yeah, he looks like a bit of a find there. Um, yeah, I would love to see Jordan Marshall get some more run. A uh, guy that I thought might be in the mix a lot more had had he not gotten injured. Um, you know, it was a bit of an uphill battle from there, and obviously he wasn't enrolled until the summer. But uh, would love to see him get a little bit uh, down the stretch, but. Not at the expense of Donovan Edwards and or Kalel Mullings if you're in a position to win a game. Like play your best players, first and foremost. Uh, let's go to this one from Zach702 who says, question, would Michigan be making this hard of a push for Bryce Underwood if he wasn't a homegrown Michigan kid 
or is it just because that they see him as the best QB in a long, long time? Regardless, the NIL thing is blown up and wondering if there's a message on here somewhere that doesn't make us look desperate and frustrating to other recruits. And I'll start with that one. I mean, I think when you have a guy, you know, it's if, if Bryce Underwood played in the state of Ohio or the state of Texas, I think it might be a little bit of a different story, but when you have, um, and, and this is what's been frustrating to me about not just his, his recruitment, but you go back to Dante Moore, you go back to some of the other guys in the state. I mean, when you have, and in this case, I mean, he's won one, he's the best quarterback in the country. He's the best player in the 2021 class. When you have that guy 20 minutes down the road, uh, down I-94, it, it would be silly to not go in, all in on him and not find ways to keep him home. And, um, you know, the previous coaching staff that Sharon Moore and Kirk Campbell were on uh, has to kind of wear the fact that it seems like they did let off the let their foot off the gas a bit when it comes to Underwood. But um, I think that it's a bit of everything. It's a bit of desperation. It's a bit of necessity. It's a bit of the fact that, hey, he's just a really, 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 really good football player. And at the most important position of the sport where you have as big a deficit right now as anyone in the country. So to me, I think it's a combination of all those things. I agree. And it's the ties to the program. He's been to a lot of Michigan games. His family's been to Michigan games and um, it's, it's an elite program again, right down the street. And you need to do everything you can to keep that talent home. Right. When you've got those ties, like you said, if you played in California, then no, uh, does it wreak a little bit of desperation? Maybe because, there are no, like we've said, there are no three or four year rebuilds anymore. You better be damn well, better be better next year than you are this year with the portal and with NIL and everything else. So, yeah, uh, I don't know that. And I don't even know that he'd be the starter next year. I, I think that you probably, if you go this route too, right, I think you kind of have to say, okay, you're our guy from week one, um, which is also a risk. But because I don't think he, you know, I don't think he would probably accept anything else, right? If they go to the portal and get a one-year stopgap, then, you know, he's probably thinking, well, you know, is it my job or isn't it my job? So a lot of variables there, but I, I agree with Anthony hundred percent. And, uh, you know, it's not over yet and we'll see what happens. If he's on campus on Saturday, we'll let EJ cover this, but we hear a lot of stuff too. And if he's on campus Saturday for Michigan's game to, with Northwestern, then I'll start getting a little bit excited. Yeah, and there's a real possibility of that happening too, which would be mm -hmm. be something to watch in addition to the game, um, you know, against Northwestern and, and Senior Day and everything going on. But that might be the the number one thing that people talk about nationally. Uh, certainly, um, I, it's it's that he's homegrown. I mean, you wouldn't have circled back to some random quarterback from uh, Rancho Cucamonga, uh, California. I do like quarterbacks from there. I've had a lot of success against them, but. Um, you know, you, you wouldn't circle back if that were the case. I think you can – Will Johnson's proved this. I think Samaj Morgan has proved this. Uh, Donovan Edwards certainly as well. You can market yourself really well, not to say you wouldn't at LSU, but being kind of a homegrown guy. I mean, you you see um, – you know, you, in, in winning the national championship helps as well, uh, obviously. But, you know, I think there are a lot of opportunities there to kind of be that guy in, in this era um, that does stay home. So I think that that's something that – would be appealing maybe from his side, but from the Michigan standpoint, I mean, the fact that you can have these conversations and you're this close in proximity, uh, you could get a guy to visit, you know, and, and drive, uh, you know, a little bit West just to get there, I think really helps. And that's kind of the reason why this has happened. It's probably the biggest reason why he had initial interest in Michigan before he committed to LSU in January. So definitely, I think the proximity played a huge factor. Think of all the opportunities you'll have for NIL, like with the car companies and stuff in Michigan, if he stays home and right. as the Michigan quarterback, right? And and everybody else. So would love to uh, would love to see him in the maize and blue in, in the winged helmet. And Detroit companies seem to really mm -hmm. like having these guys involved, like the guys from Detroit. Yeah, so exactly. I oh, I feel like Will Johnson is at a signing every other day. Like yeah. the, the, yeah. the support they give those homegrown guys is crazy. And listen, I mean, when it comes to – these freshman quarterbacks, I mean, even if they're a five-star guy, like it's probably going to come with a few losses attached to it, but it's a path forward. It's a, it's not just a lotto ticket. It's, it's, you know, development at the most important position on the field. Um, and, you know, again, when you have a guy that's the number one overall prospect, he's in here, you know, I, I think Belleville is still Wayne County, but he's essentially right next door to Washtenaw County. 
you got to find a way to, uh, to, to, to get that guy if you can. So, uh, this is from Sasquatch six, one, six. He wants to know uh, a little, a little lighter on the, the lighter side of the question spectrum, favorite pop tart flavor. And he says, for the love of God, if any of you say brown sugar cinnamon, I'm going to cancel my subscription. So your answers are pretty, pretty consequential here, fellas. Uh, brown sugar cinnamon is not my favorite. And I don't Ooh. think I've, I think I've, <laughs> see what I did there. Uh, just the regular strawberry guys, you know, maybe frosted strawberry or something. It's been a long time since I've had a pop tart. So I'm going to go with that, but I do love the thought of eating a mascot. Um, that is always, you know, I've always thought, can we get a bowl game where we can eat the mascot afterwards, you know, and, uh, a rose, and, uh, a rose, mm, you, you put know. in your mouth. Yeah, but you don't eat it, Clay. Don't swallow it. So I still have petals from the field and, uh, and they're still, you know, in my, on my dresser. Yep. On my dresser, they are not in my chili. So, but, uh, again, uh, strawberry frosted strawberry would be it for me. I'd rather go to the Rose bowl and eat a rose than go to the pop tart bowl and eat a pop tart. But, um, you well, know, depends I, on, yeah, never mind. I would stomach that. Um, I did have a pop tart a couple of weeks ago, a hotel lobby pop tart after the, uh, Indiana game, maybe that was foreshadowing. Uh, brown sugar cinnamon's good. It's not my favorite though. Strawberry, just classic, um, would also be mine. Uh, to me, I, those are good choices. I, I, I won't slander brown sugar cinnamon. It's also not my favorite. Uh, I'm a hot fudge Sunday guy. One. Yeah. Yes, hot fudge Sunday, frozen though. You Ooh. freeze that one and you eat it. It's pretty. I gotta tell you, that's not breakfast. That's just. That's terrible. Don't feed that to your kids. Be responsible <laughs> for breakfast. All right. Continue. Now, mind you, I, I've had maybe four Pop-Tarts total in the last 20 years because I'm a grown adult now. So. Sas Sasquatch's favorite flavor is roots and berries. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Let's go to this one from Bloomer, who says, pick your Big Ten regular season champion and a bonus question. What marathon do you plan on running drunk? Ooh. That's a great one. Uh, Naked Mile at Michigan. Um, that was not really a marathon, but it was a mile. Um, and I was drunk. So I hope my mom's not watching this. Uh, and then the uh, that's back when it was still legal. And then the um, what was the other question? Big Ten basketball uh, regular season champ. Basketball? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, good Lord, man. I have no idea. Um, probably Purdue. I think they're well coached and I think they're probably the highest ranked team in the, in the Big Ten right now. So I'll go with Purdue. I haven't seen a whole lot of teams that really wow me. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, there are a lot of teams that look solid, um, but I don't know that we have that dominant team this year, which opens the door for a team. You know, let's say Michigan clicks and just kind of um, you know, plays really well. I, I think that they could they could certainly compete for it. I have to go with Purdue. I thought the win um, on Saturday against or, or Friday night against Alabama was uh, really impressive, even though it was at home. I hope that doesn't discourage teams from playing some of those games because that's awesome that Alabama um, decided to come up and and play Purdue uh, at Mackey. So uh, I have to go with Purdue. They have the best win in the conference this year. They're undefeated and they were the favorite coming in. I'll be that guy. I'll just say it's going to be Michigan. I, I, there are 18 teams, and I have no idea. There you go. I mean, it's, it's how many idea. how many teams will tie? A ton. Yeah, there's going to be a lot. I mean, you're looking at a situation. The fact that you just go on Kempom, and they have Purdue winning the league at 13 and 7, and there's like five teams at 12 and 8 right, right beneath that. I mean, it's one game swing here or there, especially with teams going across time zones. I Right. I have no idea. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if UCLA won it. I wouldn't be surprised if Michigan won it. I mean, there's six or seven teams that I think could legitimately have a claim to that. So it should be, be fun to watch. If, I'd be surprised if Michigan State won it because they don't have any shooters. Yep. I can't argue that. Uh, Dallard J threw a lot of them at us. I'm going to pick one. Uh, we'll go from this one. He says, assuming Michigan finishes six and six, when do you see the first, the first coaching domino fall? Is it a day after the Ohio state game? Not until after the bowl game. What does that timeline look like? I'll bet mid December. 
but I hope that they are honest with the recruits too and saying, hey, we might make some changes, right? Because you don't want to say, hey, here's your position coach. And then all of a sudden here, this is not your position coach anymore, right? So, um, and I think you have to be, right, with the portal and everything else. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm guessing that they will be. But my guess is, you know, uh, uh, maybe a week, maybe after the championship games. And, uh, but we have a pretty good idea that there will be some changes made. Yeah, that, that's a good point on signing days, December 4th, which is, you know, the week after Ohio State on that Wednesday leading into the conference championship games. But now you're not even signing national letters of intent anymore. You're signing Big Ten athletic scholarship agreements. Mm -hmm. They can get out, I would assume, at, at any time. I haven't seen one of those uh, drafted up yet, but it, the world has changed because of revenue sharing and, and everything else. If the House versus NCAA case is finalized, the, the settlement to that, uh, then all those, you know, everything they signed in these athletic agreements will go into effect. Um, and, you know, I, I think that if you do pull a, an Ohio State Mike Weber situation where you say, oh, yeah, this is our running backs coach. He's going to be here. Uh, and then that guy leaves for a, a different job a day after signing day. The kids got options uh, now. So you have to be a little bit more honest than maybe you, you would before. And Let's be honest. I mean, the, there's been a lot of slimy stuff that has gone on with some of these recruitments over the years, not at Michigan, but around the country that you see. So I, I would imagine um, we see something, you know, a couple days after the Ohio State game and then more throughout the, the month as they kind of decide what direction they want to go, what options are out there for them. Uh, so it's going to things are going to move fast and furious between signing day that and, and the transfer portal. Yeah, and I think. You know, to, to Chris's point about the recruits, I mean, you you look through their 2025 class and without speculating on who may or may not uh, have a future at Michigan in the role that they're currently in, um, I don't know that there's any move they can make that is incredibly consequential there. Um, and you could do that math on your own if you want to look at the, you know, the commits that they have. But um I'm not super worried about this recruiting class because I think Sharon Moore, like we talked about earlier, has been kind of the point man for a lot of their top guys. So uh, I'm not super concerned about that. But you know, you are hopeful that they're able to, you know, that that they are honest with these guys and and forthright. And you know, you don't you just don't want to have bad a bad headline about what a kid said or what happened to a kid because of something you said or did. So um I don't know. I think that's it for us. Have any other thoughts before we uh, close out here? Let's have a good week and have a great Thanksgiving. And damn it, let's uh, let's get that man. They just show up against Ohio State. Let's make that one fun. That's right. Can I, I say? Can I say something about that? I, I don't want to plant a flag or give a score prediction, but right now, I, and it could change based on what we see Ohio State do or don't do against Indiana this weekend, but. I really do think Michigan's going to be in a game with Ohio State. And I I fear that they will be, and then they get in their own way, and then things kind of spiral out of control. But I think that they are going to be in a four-quarter game against Ohio State. I hope so. That'd be fantastic. That's when Ryan Day puckers and that whole stadium puckers, and that's when they lose. And that means the defense plays extremely well because, yep. uh, or you get, or you get a couple breaks, a couple breakdowns and protections, and like you had and uh, a couple of years ago, and maybe some fluke plays or something like that. Maybe a special teams play. Yeah, mm -hmm. we haven't seen much of that. Nope. all year. But like you said earlier, I mean, crazy things can happen. We've seen mm -hmm. Michigan teams win when they're not supposed to. We've seen, or or keep it closer than they're supposed to. Um, same with Ohio State teams as well throughout the year. So it's certainly possible. Um, definitely possible and I, I just think that the offense is just so bad at this point um that it, it, a lot is on the defense right now yep. but if the defense keeps putting them in some positions to to win they, they have to be able to put some drives together late in the game to to get some points i mean that was ridiculous at indiana and uh you know so the offense whatever they did in the bye week maybe it's some sort of magic if they can, if they can kind of improve and, and become a different offense here down the down the stretch, that would that would certainly help. I'll give you a football reason for it. You know, I watch this Ohio State team, and yeah, I mean, they have the sizzle. They've got the backs. They've got really good skilled players. I think Will Howard um, has taken way too many unnecessary shots from his own fan base. I think he's played really well this year. Mm -hmm. um, defensively, they're pretty good, but just 
it's just different from those urban Meyer teams where like they were, they were big and menacing and imposing up front on both sides of the ball. And, you know, you, you hear so much about Michigan talking about, Oh, the offensive line, it's one guy here. It's a breakdown there. If they could just have a good day at the office, uh -huh. I think that they have the chance to, to kind of hold up in a fist fight in the trenches, certainly on the, def you know, with their defensive line too. I mean, that, that is going to be the single most consequential position group in that game. So uh, we'll see what happens there. Just some early thoughts on that. Um, that's where I'm at with it. So uh, thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, I know it's a little bit later this week, but I wanted to make sure we had the full kind of um, menu of topics on the table for you. Uh, you can like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, for more podcasts from uh, press conferences, uh, EJ's recruiting analysis. It's all there and more. Use that promo code UM1 for two months of access to our site for only a dollar. And uh, that'll do it for us. Uh, for Chris Ballas, Clayton Safey, our producer Megan behind the scenes, I'm Anthony Broom. We'll talk to you again next time.